Hey guys, how's it going? Mr Mitchell here. In this video we're going to go over centripetal acceleration and centripetal force. Now these are two related quantities that are pretty important for understanding the circular motion of an object. So let's get started. Okay, so we're going to start by looking at centripetal acceleration and then move on to centripetal force. Now there's a definition here for centripetal acceleration, otherwise known as radial acceleration, and it says that centripetal acceleration is the acceleration of an object moving in a circular path which acts towards the centre of axis of rotation. So what we mean is the acceleration is acting towards the centre, not that the object is moving towards the centre. Now we can derive an equation for centripetal or radial acceleration, though you should be aware that the derivation for this is not examinable, so you would not be asked to do what we're about to go through just now. The only reason I'm going to show you is to show you that we've not just plucked out this new equation for centripetal acceleration out of thin air. So first Firstly, we want to consider an object moving with some velocity v from a point A to a point B in a circle of radius r, as shown in this picture here. So there's our point A, there's our point B, and there's the centre of the circular path that that object will move round in. So if we consider the velocity at the point A to be velocity va, and this is our sort of tangential or linear velocity coming off from point A in a straight line, and if we also consider the velocity at point B to be this linear or tangential velocity vb coming off here, then we can write the change in velocity down here as delta v equals vb minus va. So the change in velocity between these two points a and b is going to be the velocity at the point b minus the velocity at the point a. So that's us got an expression for the change in velocity now. I also just want to point out that the arc that we've swept out from a to b has an angle theta and the radius of that circular path is also r. Now because we've drawn two vectors of velocity va and vb then we want to add those two vectors together nose to tail. So adding these two vectors together nose to tail gives us something that looks like this. So we've got our two vectors there, VA and VB, so adding those nose to tail gives us this resultant vector down here. Now we're going to just do a wee bit of analysis here using trigonometry to work out the overall magnitude of the resultant vector down here. So the first thing we're going to do is just split this bigger triangle into two, so we can do that with this line here. And that means that the overall angle theta that we got from our arc from this picture up here, so that was our angle theta, we can divide that angle theta into two parts because we're splitting the triangle into two. So that makes this little angle in here theta over two, and it also makes this one down here theta over two. Now, if we wanted an expression for this part of the triangle here, then we could use this saw part from Sokotoa for sine theta equals opposite over hypotenuse. So it would be sine theta over two in this case. So sine theta over two is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse, which is that one there. So if I want my opposite side, it's going to be my hypotenuse times my angle. So we get v sine theta over 2. For now, we're just going to ignore the subscript a and call it its velocity v. And down here, we're doing the exact same thing. So we've got theta over 2 in here. If we do sine theta over 2 equals opposite over the hypotenuse there, then we also get an expression for v sine theta over 2, ignoring the subscript of b there. So this means the total length of this resultant vector is going to be the v sine theta over 2 from this one, added on to the v sine theta over 2 from here, which gives us a total of 2 v sine theta over 2. Hopefully you're following along with this. So this means that we can state our resultant vector, which is the change in velocity, as equal to vb minus v a, which is equal to what we've just worked out. We've just worked out that that resultant vector is equal to 2 v sine theta over 2. And if we now come up with an expression for the time taken to travel from A to B in our arc, so remember this was our arc A to B, so we now want the time for the object to travel from A to B. So if we come up with an expression there, we've got delta t equals arc length AB over the speed v. So this is essentially just time equals distance over speed. It's just a speed distance time formula. So the change in time is equal to the arc length AB because that's the distance that we've swept out divided by the speed v is equal to r theta over v. Now remember we saw arc length in a previous video which was s equals r theta so the arc length that we've swept out here is equal to our radius there multiplied by the angle that we've swept through. So we've got r theta divided by the speed v. Now we have an expression for the change in velocity and the change in time and we can now use our definition of acceleration. So remember we said acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time or the rate of change of velocity. So if we write down the change change in velocity over the change of time, we can put in our two expressions that we've just worked out. So this is equal to 2v sine theta over 2 over r theta over v. Now we're going to use something called the small angle approximation. And this says that for small angles of theta, sine theta is approximately equal to the angle theta. So this means that our expression here, sine theta over 2, 
for small angles of theta will just become theta over 2. So if we write this in terms of our radial or centripetal acceleration AR, then this is equal to the change in velocity over the change in time, which is equal to 2 v theta over 2 over r theta over v. Remember, that's just simplifying using the small angle approximation. And if we now bring the v up to the top and multiply it by what's already there and cancel out the 2s, then we end up with v squared theta over r theta. And you'll see we now have a theta on the top and bottom, which can also cancel out. So this gives us ar equals v squared over r. And that is our expression for centripetal or radial acceleration. So this is the equation that you'll see on the relationship sheet in the exam. So you don't need to be able to do what we've just done, remember. You just need to be able to use this equation for centripetal acceleration. So it says that AR equals V squared over R, where AR is the radial acceleration measured in meters per second squared, V is the linear or tangential velocity measured in meters per second, and R is the radius of the circular path measured in meters. Now let's say you're doing a question and it doesn't give you the linear or tangential velocity v, but instead it gives you the angular velocity omega, then we can actually come up with an expression involving omega instead of v for our centripetal acceleration. So we've already got the ar equals v squared over r, so if we use an important equation from a previous video which is v equals r omega for the linear or tangential velocity, so if we substitute in for v into the top of our fraction here, then we get r squared omega squared over r, and r squared divided by r is just going to give us an r value, but we still have the omega squared term. So we have AR equals V squared over R, which is also equal to R omega squared. So these are two very important equations that you can use for centripetal or radial acceleration. Now, a couple of last things to note for centripetal acceleration is that the direction of centripetal acceleration is always towards the center of the circle and is at right angles to the tangential acceleration. If we just go back to our picture of the circle, then what we mean is, let's say our object is at the point A, then at the point A, the object is going to have a centripetal acceleration acting towards the center of the circle circle at that point, and that's what keeps it in a circular motion. So the centripetal acceleration always acts towards the center of the circular path of the motion. And we also said it will be at right angles to the tangential acceleration, so if we're at this point A, so if the object is again at this point A, then its tangential acceleration will be in the exact same direction as the velocity VA there. So its tangential acceleration would be off here in this direction, whereas the centripetal acceleration would be acting at right angles to that towards the center. And the last note there says that this is not a uniform acceleration. Centripetal acceleration continuously changes direction and its magnitude changes as the speed of rotation changes. So remember, because the object is continually moving in a circle, its direction will be changing and because acceleration is a vector quantity, it's going to have a magnitude and a direction. So remember we said in the previous video that if direction changes then the acceleration has to change itself as well. And the magnitude of the acceleration will also change as the speed of that object changes around the circle, if it's not moving at a constant velocity that is. Next we're going to look at centripetal force and this is related to centripetal acceleration. So it says here, consider the following argument to help you understand centripetal force. So I'm going to read out this little scenario to you. So it says, most people have experienced the sensation of being in a car or a bus which is turning a corner at high speed. The feeling of being thrown to the outside of the curve is very strong, especially if you slide along the seat. So that would be the case if you weren't wearing your seatbelt. What happens here is that the friction between yourself and the seat is insufficient to provide the central force needed to deviate you from the straight line path you were following before the turn. In fact, instead of being thrown outwards, you are in reality continuing in a straight line while the car actually moves inwards. Eventually, you're moved from the straight line path by the inward central force provided by the door. Now, notice we've said central force here. Central force is just another word for centripetal force. Now, another way to think about this is if you take an object and you attach it to the end of a piece of string, and let's say you spin that object with the string above your head. Well, it shouldn't be a surprise for you to think that if somebody is turning an object on a piece of string above their head, and if you were to take a pair of scissors, say, and cut that string above the head, then the object will actually move off in a straight line. This is the same sort of idea in this scenario. So an object will continue to move in a circular path as long as there is a centripetal acceleration and therefore a centripetal force causing it to move in a circular motion. Otherwise it will move off in a straight line path at a tangent to the circle at the point that it was cut. The next thing here says that if an object has a centripetal acceleration, it follows that there will be an unbalanced force acting on it. This is a centripetal force which always acts towards the centre of the circle. So just like centripetal acceleration acts towards the centre of the circle, 
centripetal force will always act towards the centre of the circle as well. It then says a centripetal force acting on an object is necessary to maintain circular motion. So we already said that a bit earlier, but we need centripetal force to make sure that an object is going to keep moving in a circular motion. And this comes from Newton's second law. Now remember F equals ma for Newton's second law, and if we substitute in our expression for centripetal acceleration, which could be a equals v squared over r, or a equals r omega squared, then we can write F equals mv squared over r, is equal to mr omega squared. And all we've done there is substitute in the expressions for centripetal acceleration there into Newton's second law. Now this is another important equation that you'll get on the relationship sheet in the exam, and it tells you the symbols and the units here. So F is centripetal force measured in Newtons, M is mass measured in kilograms, V is linear or tangential velocity measured in meters per second, R is the radius of the circular path measured in meters, and omega is the angular velocity measured in radians per second. Now we're just going to look at two examples of where a centripetal acceleration and therefore a centripetal force are required to keep an object moving in circular motion. So the first one we're going to look at is an aeroplane banking at an angle. So it says when the aeroplane is in level flight, the weight of the plane, W equals mg downwards, is balanced by the lift provided by the wings. So remember for a plane, lift is the force upwards, balancing the weight downwards, and it's going to balance because we're in level flight here, a constant height. So we're saying that that mg upwards is equal to that mg downwards. Then says that when it banks, which is this turning motion that the plane does, the lift provided by the wings is at an angle. So there's your lift vector at an angle and we're just representing the plane by a circular dot there. It then says that this provides an upwards component to balance the weight and a centripetal component to cause the plane to turn. So if we have our two vectors there, mg and our lift vector there, then our force vector here is our centripetal force that makes it move in a circular motion. So in this specific example, the centripetal force is given by this expression here, mg tan theta. And that's just using Sokka Toa, the Toa part, tan theta equals opposite over adjacent to get the f equals mg tan theta. The second and last example is for a conical pendulum, and a conical pendulum is just a pendulum that moves in a cone-like motion. So if a conical pendulum is swinging in a circular path, there must be a centripetal force responsible for maintaining that circular path. This comes from the horizontal component of the tension in the suspending string. So there's your string there, holding onto the object. We've got a tension acting up the way from the object to wherever the string is suspended from, and it's going to move in a circular motion, sweeping out an angle theta. Now because our tension t is that vector there, then we can work out what this vector is here, which is causing the circular motion. And that's going to be t sine theta, just using Sokka Toa again, because sine theta there is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse, so we get our expression t sine theta. That's all for this video folks, I hope you found it useful. If you did, give it a like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.